Hi brothers and sisters, through some prayer about a specific subject I have um, been thinking about and you know, you know, you spend time on different subjects with the Lord and you go to prayer and things like this and the Lord, I believe, has given me a very interesting sort of analogy um, and I wanted to, it's kind of a, more of a metaphor, um, so I want to bring it to you guys. So this is for those of you professing to be Christians. Um, okay, so imar- imagine there's a married couple, newly married, yeah, and the husband says to his wife, look honey, I really have some things that I don't really like, and for example, I, I specifically really hate the smell of Parma violets. I just detest it, I hate it, I hate the smell of it, and you know, that's that's what I hate. Now, the wife, on her next shopping trip, she goes to the, the supermarket and she goes down to the, um, the room spray section and she specifically looks and she finds Palmer Violet spray and she actually buys that spray and then she takes it home and then she sprays the whole house with that scent. Now, is that wife respectful and loving of her husband no she's not she's she's actively hearing what her husband wants and what he doesn't want and doing the opposite she's actively being disobedient to the one she says she loves now actions speak louder than words there are so many christians that say that they love god but yet they are doing the very thing that he hates. Now, I understand there are so many of us that deal with sin daily. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about willful disobedience. I'm not talking about struggling with specific sins. You know, it's all about the intention of the heart. If you say you love God and you want to follow his word and you slip up and there's a repeated sin that you slip up with, I mean, we're all there. We've all been there. We're all going through something with the Lord but it's the intent of the heart are you repentant are you wanting to please God or are you actively rebelling actively being in disobedience and and putting your hand up to God whilst he is on the cross with what he's done loving you and still acting in such a awful way towards him now I'm not here to condemn, but I'm here to shake it up a bit because I'm concerned for some of you that um, that you might be deceiving yourselves. Um, there's there's so many Christians that say they love God, yet they don't follow his word. And so I just wanted to read this um, in the scriptures. I was reading this this morning and last night and you know, it's, it's, it's very simple, but some of us can look past these things and miss the point, as it were. And the devil's very good at tricking us to think that there's something more than the simple to, to grasp and to, you know, like you see people that are um, online and they're arguing about doctrine because they're trying to prove who's the most religious and who's the most honoring of God whilst stepping on one another and treating each other badly. Now that is missing the point, right? Because we're supposed to love one another. Um, so John fourteen twenty one says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So the Lord is promising us the the promise of the Holy Spirit that he will come and dwell within us and make himself manifest within us if we truly love him. And how do we truly love him? By keeping his commandments, by following his word by wanting to do that that is pleasing to him by not spraying palm of violet around the home by actively going in the cupboards and if there's anything like that remain that smells similar to it then getting rid of it you know it's that willful wanting to please the lord that is 
those who love him. That there's so many people that say they love God and yet they just don't care. They don't care what he asks for. They don't care about his heart. They don't care about what it is to please him. And I mean, I would say that that's not loving God. Well, I wouldn't say that God says that in his word, you know. So, um, okay, so when he says, keep my commandments, what does he mean by that? So if we look in Matthew 22, and I'm just doing some overviews of, of some scriptures. I'm not going into the word and dissecting it and teaching because I'm not for that at all as a woman. But I will look at some scriptures and speak to you guys about this. Um, because I think it's loving to actually shake things up a bit sometimes. It's loving to say, hey, there's some issues here and, and we need to discuss it rather than um, just acting like everything is just fine and smooth sailing. There's a lot of stuff that I'm seeing and I need to speak up about it. Um, so Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven to 40, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hangs all the law and the prophets. So it's to love the Lord first and then love one another. I mean, we can't actually love one another without knowing how to love through God loving us first, right? But you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul and with all of your mind. So that's coming into alignment with the Lord's will, loving him so much that you give yourself completely to him, every part of yourself. And that means different aspects of yourself that God doesn't find pleasing. Um, so I want to just look at Matthew um, 6, 24. Okay, says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Manon, mammon is money, right, back in those days, but it's a picture of the world. So it's saying you can't love um, the world and love God at the same time. Uh, it's at enmity with one another, but so um, this is this is the thing. What I'm trying to get at there's there's a lot of Christians out there that have their toe in the world and their toe in um, in the Lord, and it doesn't work like that, does it? It just can't work like that because if you get consumed into the world, it pulls you away from God completely. It's godless in this world, and then if you follow the Lord and you walk with Him, you Became, become alien to this world because they they don't fit with one another, do they? Um, and I think that's just a great picture of how you need to be 100% sold out for Jesus. You need to be one or the other, right? You need to be either hot or cold. Um, now, going back to the analogy of the Palmer violets in the house and the husband saying he doesn't like the scent of that and then the wife say you're the wife and you you know um there's a difference between the ignorance of doing something in unbelief so for example where paul talks about him sinning before he knew christ and that was in unbelief um and in ignorance it's like you go around and you start spraying loads of palmer violet around the house and then the husband comes home and he tells you, that's not pleasing to me, you know, like when you're born again. And then you go, whoa, there were so many things I didn't even know I did that were not pleasing to God. But now I know and I won't do that. So there's a difference there, isn't there, of doing it. It's the motives and the intentions, right? It's like I didn't know that that was specifically something he hated that I was doing. And now I know him. Now I know he hates that. Now if I continue to do that, then it's different. And and the 
the intention of the heart whilst you know there's I'm, I'm not here to condemn because there's loads of different sins that we we have to um go through sanctification and it takes time right you know like for me it was it was smoking i was smoking for ages after i came to the lord and i felt so condemned um but the lord walked me through it and now i haven't been smoking for over a year it's been amazing praise god so there are you know there's i'm not saying that we're going to come to god and it's all going to be perfect but i'm saying it's it's like are you going through a sin and going hmm you know whatever i just like my sin and i'm not going to repent or are you going ah i've done it again i keep doing it lord help me help me help me and keep persevering in repentance bit by bit by bit and you will get there eventually it's not going to be sometimes things happen overnight you know we wish it could but certain things take time but there's the difference with with someone feeling conviction of the holy spirit and those that are um actively um actively hardening their hearts to the conviction of the Holy Spirit and and making up excuses as to why they should continue in their sin, right? So, for example, with the Palmer Violet thing, it's like a wife saying, oh, well, you know, he, he just told, he, he just tells her that he doesn't like Palmer Violets. And then she's in the supermarket and she's looking at the sprays and then she goes to pick up the Palmer Violet and she says, Oh, well, I think what he really meant was he doesn't like the colour of violet in the home, so I won't do that, but I can do this, you know, twisting his words to excuse herself to do the thing that he hates. Are you doing that? Um, so, you know, let me read actually about Paul, about him doing it in ignorance. Uh, in, it's in First Timothy... 1, 12 to 13. Yeah, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Um, I've got a little example as well of someone who does it in belief. So, you know, they know what they're doing and they're willfully doing it and, and not repentant. I must put that in because I don't want to condemn people. Um, okay, so in Second Peter 2, 21 to 22. First Peter. So, yeah. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandments delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. So this is an example of those who it would have been better if they had never known God than to have disobeyed him you know it's it makes sense right because just on a really simplistic level um you have someone you know like you have a husband and you don't know he hates the smell of palm violet so you spray it around the house or you know he hates it and then you spray it around the house big difference isn't there there's just a big difference um so yeah you know when talking with people when uh, ministering to christians and there's this hot and cold scenario it's really frustrating because if you're not 100 percent sold out for jesus it's really boring it being a christian is really difficult and and it's really dull without being 100% sold out for Christ because when you are willing to say yes to him with everything and you know just keep walking and and you know giving yourself as a sacrifice to the Lord yes you still slip up yes you still fail daily but 
you know, with the willingness to please him and, you know, just drop everything and follow him, there is so much blessing in that and there's so much for um, every Christian if you're willing to do that. It's the most amazing and exciting thing ever, as many of you know. Um, but let's just look at that scripture in Revelation. It's good to have a healthy fear of the Lord. And um, I think it's important that we talk about repentance and, you know, not willfully disobeying the Lord and, you know, just taking what he's given you, his death on the cross, and then still acting willfully against him. It's just, it's beyond me actually, but... So Revelation 3, 15 to 16 says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. <sighs> you know, that that's just some stark language there and you know everyone should be working out their salvation with fear and trembling and if you're not then ask the Lord for a healthy dose of fear of fear of the Lord because that right there terrifies me you know that's that's it you know it, there's there's those people that are saying they're Christians but they're not they're not and there's people that are actively wolves out there that, that find those types of Christians and prey on them. You know, like the feel good or the prosperity or the Joel Olstein sort of stuff. All of that. Those wolves are out there to grab this type of person that is not sold out for Christ, that still wants their own desires, that still wants to spray their own palm violet spray around the house, you know. And those preachers will tell them that that's fine to do so. And that God said, yes, don't paint your house violet. That's what he meant. You know, like twisting the word. Um, so let's have a look in Romans. Romans 12, 2. It says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed in your mind by, by reading what, his, what he loves. What is his will? I mean, in, in here it says his will is to sanctify you and, you know, that's to clean you up and make you holy and make you walk according to his likes and dislikes and you know hate what he hates and love what he loves and be more christ-like be more like him he you know for our own good <laughs> because we are darkness without the lord and yeah so to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god you know that's what we should be doing brothers and sisters is actively knowing with our husband in the house, actively knowing what colours he likes, what smells he likes, what food does he like, what pleases our Lord, what can we do to please him? Um, and if we haven't thought about that, pray about it. Pray to the Lord. Um, that This is a prayer that I was doing. Uh, Lord, show me what you love. Please change my heart to love what you love and hate what you hate. I want to um, align myself with your will, Lord, you're on the throne of my heart, have your way with me, change me, shape me into how you plan me to be. Um, and that's, that's the right intention to be at. Even if you keep sinning, even if you keep m making the same mistake over and over again, you keep persevering in repentance bit by bit by bit by bit. And you look back, don't you, and you think, whoa, the Lord's done so much there that I could never have done myself. But it's just with you being willing. You know, the Lord can do so much with a Christian who is willing. <laughs> you know, like me and James often sit back and we think, what on earth? Like, how? Only through God could he have taken such broken and wretched vessels that we were and, and use us. No way. No way it could happen without the Lord. Just no way. 
and we're very thankful. Um, so let's have a look in Romans, stay in Romans 12, but verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You know, that's brilliant. It's just standard. Just, just give your everything to God. And that's the basics. <laughs> I love that because, you know, he gave everything for us. You know, he went through such torture and pain on the cross for us. And, you know, we have to put it into perspective of what are you willing to give up? What are you willing to sacrifice whilst looking at what the Lord did for you on the cross? When he gave you everything. Are you, are you willing to give up certain things that are maybe idols on your heart that you find so consuming that you, you know is not pleasing to the Lord but yet you're doing the things that he doesn't like? Those things? Are you still wanting to hold on to those things when you see what the Lord has done for you? And maybe those of you that are lukewarm and and maybe you haven't tasted that the Lord is good maybe you haven't really been born again I don't know only you know and I'm just asking you like what we've been doing um, as a church we've been asking the Lord to search our hearts what are our motives in in all that we do for the Lord and so this message I suppose is going to be called being a sweet aroma you know or something like that because <laughs> going back to the palm violet spray in the house it's all about the smells right and and the aromas and to be a sweet smell to the lord and not what he dislikes so i want to leave it on second corinthians um verse uh, no, chapter 2 verse 14 to 15 now thanks be to god who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fra fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. So I encourage you, brethren, to start focusing, if you, maybe you are already, on what pleases the Lord, what you can do, or if you really love him, if you're really following his ways, if you really want to follow him and, and you know, leave everything at the altar and just give him your, yourselves fully. And there is so much in that. There is so much reward in that. When you lose your life for, for his sake, you find it. It is so true. And so many of you can testify of this. When you're 100% sold out for the Lord, what he can do and how much he transforms your life. And um, I'd love it if, if you could leave in the comments below different ways in which you sacrificed certain things or you walked in obedience in certain things that were difficult for you and you, you you still obeyed the Lord and what reward came from that? Please, can you encourage one another in this aspect and, and leave your stories below and um, I look forward to speaking to you next time. God bless you all. Bye.